Awesome. First of all, I just want to thank everybody um, for hosting me tonight. I am beyond honored and really excited to get to talk to you. Uh, my name is Rob Minchin, as I'm Craig Donovan, the Vice President of Partner Services over at PAX8. Um, tonight, I want to talk to you a little bit about what we're doing at PAX8, more importantly, what we're doing in partnership with FEDC, and also some interesting trends um, and some opportunity, I think, that has come out of the last year that I want to share with you. But before I get to all that. Um, I actually want to take a minute to um, introduce myself, and if you'll indulge me, I'm actually going to tell a little bit of my story backwards. Um, today I am an executive of PAX8, and it's been unbelievable. I've gotten to be with a company and help build it from 30 people to over 600. I've traveled the country and met with thousands of MSPs and partners to talk about technology, what they're doing with their business, how it's impacting their customers. And before that, I had the opportunity to be a software developer for about 18 years. Worked with really killer software, designed really interesting tools, and, and solved really tough problems. But to get to there, I had the luxury of getting to be a student at Mesa State College. And I'm probably dating myself a little bit because now I think it's Colorado Mesa University. But really, I think the important part of that story is the fact that before that, I was a kid in Tibet, Colorado. Debec is a little tiny ranching community outside of Grand Junction. There's about 300 people in town, maybe 300 people if you count the cows living outside. <laughs> and we had six paved roads, not a single street light or traffic light, grocery store or gas station. And so when I talk to you tonight, it's not just as an employee of Pax8 or an ally of economic development down here, which I certainly am. But I'm also talking to you as somebody that's a product of the very same kind of community. And as being a product of rural Colorado, I understand some things. I understand that it's a little bit different living in rural Colorado, but that's good. That I know what it's like when you don't have a hardware store within an hour. And so the problems don't wait, and so you figure it out. You make do with what you have. And ingenuity and innovation are inherently a part of rural Colorado. I understand that, that the job has to get done. I grew up in a ranching family. And I can tell you right now, the cows don't always wait for sunny afternoons to need help. And sometimes you're out there at 2 in the morning in a snowstorm figuring it out. The toughness and resilience are in the DNA of rural Colorado. And most importantly, I get that community is the fabric that ties it all together. Neighbors who care. Neighbors who show up when you need help. More importantly, neighbors who show up when you want to celebrate. Right? That's what rural Colorado is. And those values have been with me my whole life. And I worked at a lot of amazing companies up until my whole career. But it wasn't until I got to Pax8, this cutting edge, bleeding edge, cloud technology company founded in Denver, that was founded by and created by CEO and founder John Street, that was built on those same sort of values. That the same things that, that drive rural Colorado make Pax8 work. Innovation, resilience, community. And so, what is this Pax8 thing? You know, at a high level, we want to simplify the technology, the way that technology professionals buy, sell, and manage cloud solutions. By doing that, the goal is to actually help empower those partners so that they can do more, find more success. That may not clear it up, so let me drill in just a little bit deeper. What we're really doing is we built an entire cloud ecosystem to solve this very cool problem, which is I've got global cloud software vendors, people you've probably heard of, guys like uh, Microsoft and IBM. Also finding ones that maybe you haven't, and we've gone completely global, we're finding the best technology the world has to offer. So I've got Iron Scales coming out of Israel. I've got Bitdefender coming out of Romania. I've got Spam Titan from Northern Ireland. They all have really amazing software that they want to sell to everybody, including the dentist here in downtown Florence. But they can't figure out how to talk. So Pax8 has solved this by creating an entire ecosystem in the middle. It starts with killer technology. We've written, basically it's the Amazon for cloud services. World-class, innovative ways to order, build, and deliver that software. But that's not enough. So then we layer on the people aspect with tailored, next-level education for our partners and world-class technical support. All that is designed specifically to help our, our technological professionals, our, our partners, succeed. And so these are, if you imagine, these are regional IT professionals. So if you think about the dentist, the restaurant, the lawyer, the real estate agent, they typically don't have their own IT professional on staff. 
so they need somebody to come in and help them. Those are our managed service providers, and those are who we help empower. That's the what we do, which I could certainly talk about all day, but what I get most excited actually is the how. And we do it by building an unbelievable culture that really cares about people. And recently we've been recognized by a number of publications as one of the best places in Colorado to work. And in fact, the Denver Business Journal has recently chosen as two years running the best company in all of Colorado to work. A lot of that is benefits, jobs, <laughs> the stuff you might expect. Some of it might even be the stuff you'd expect out of this cool next wave tech company. Beer and kombucha on tap, when we're in the office, we got, I can't sit there for more than 15 minutes without a scooter zipping by or a Segway. But what it's really about is not all the cool, it's about the important, which is the people. We believe foundationally that we can't do this new thing, because we are, when we're going, there's no map. We're inventing it every single day. And so to do that, we need people to grow with us. And so it's a deep investment into every single one of our employees. And so this is job coaching, this is shadowing. We've got an unbelievable team of the Pax 8 University who's created thousands of hours of vir both virtual and live content to help people develop. And all this has led to some wild success in the last year, which is 2020 was hard for everybody, including Pax 8. And there's two numbers that I get really excited about. The first is we added 100 jobs in 2020, even during this COVID downturn. What's way more important to me is we had over 200 promotions. Right? Pax 8 is built to help people along the road. And right now, Pax 8 is really at this intersection between cloud technology and remote working. Just like many of you, we had to go remote. In March 2020, when it all hit, we had 500 employees that could no longer be in an office. Within 36 hours, we had shifted the entire company home, working from home. That means we were still selling, still developing software, doing our world-class support, doing all of our educational initiatives without missing a beat. And that actually laid the groundwork, talking about some good things that have come of this, for our partnership with Fremont County. We had all, Susan Mitnick joined one of your tech, who's our chief people officer, had joined one of your tech partnership meetings back in late 2019, was blown away and really intrigued by the magic that you had cooking down here. But we weren't sure that we could make this work. We weren't sure that the culture could translate outside the office. And then, in March, we found out we didn't have a choice. And it turned out everything kept flying. Not only was work getting done, but the culture was stronger than ever. And so we figured out it's time to try a pilot. And so we connected with Brad in the Immersion Campus, and we decided to run a very, very narrow pilot with very strict guidelines, in which I told Brad, I'm gonna grab four, maybe five people, and we're just gonna watch for at least a year. And we hired four amazing people, and this was our first class. We brought in Nate Chandler, Teresa Campbell, David Webb, Justin Passero, and Ashley Arnold to take on four different roles, some entry-level tech, as well as Ashley, who's running our overall empowerment efforts. And then, just through that effort, we discovered DJ, and we brought him on in a role we weren't even planning on keeping as part of the pilot. Everyone, this was the shortest pilot in the history of all pilots. <laughs> Whereas I was expecting to keep this at arm's distance and just watch it for a year, within six weeks, I fully understood what you guys had cooking down here. Every single one of these people came on board with the absolute perfect mix of technical aptitude, of ambition, of drive, of personality. So much so that they weren't just fitting in with what we were doing at Pack Sake, they were adding. They were creating something new for what we were doing. And immediately, we opened up the rest of our jobs. And we said, let's start putting more people in. And then we decided, it's probably not enough to just augment what we're already doing. We created an entirely new initiative that could hire employ as many as dozens of people that is all where rural Colorado will be the sole engine for this. We've already added three more people from that team, so we're up to a total of nine people working out of the Emergent Campus, with more people still to come this quarter. This is actually my favorite slide in the entire presentation. This is just some of our employees in their own words. And I'll just kind of let you read those while I talk. This one meant the most to me because one of the concerns I personally had about doing the rural initiative, about moving jobs remotely, is I love the Pax 8 culture. There's, there's a juice there, there's a magic there that I just can't get enough of. And I was afraid that if we brought on a rural initiative, I wouldn't be able to translate it. It wouldn't be as good. And it turns out, 
you know, because what we're looking for is not just, again, I don't want to just build a warehouse and just drop some jobs into Fremont County and take advantage of your labor. We want to be a part of this with you. We want to create really awesome aspirational jobs that then progress and do new things. More than that, we want to be a part of the community. We want to get to know you. We want to develop this hand in hand. And I want to make sure that this is the best job that everybody that joins us ever has. And so far, based on this feedback, it looks like maybe we're hitting the mark. And so one of the things about this last year is there is a lot of opportunity. When I, and I'm going to shift a little bit from pure Pax 8 centric things and talk a little bit like Rob did about the pivot and the opportunity that's in front of all of us. You know, this, word, this idea of the new normal gets used a little bit too much, but it's very appropriate right now. The fact is the new normal is changing and it is cloud. You know, historically, work had to be done where the work is. And when you're talking technology, work is wherever the really expensive piece of machinery is. Right? And if you're going to have a server farm and you're going to have computers, you put it in an urban center, which meant kids like myself that grew up in Tobacco and they went to college in Grand Junction had to go to Denver in order to work. The cloud has shrunk that. We can put the server wherever you want. We can put it in Germany. We can put it in Australia. And as long as you've got an internet connection, you can now connect. So this means now it's really powerful. People get to start to live where they want to and work from wherever they want to work. But the other side of this is this dovetails perfectly in what you're doing with P-Tech and the work at the high schools and Pueblo Community College where you are developing this amazing pipeline of really incredible kids who want to go do something technical and they no longer have to leave Fremont County to have a technical job. There's a real opportunity in front of us right now um, with all of the change. And one of the things I want to talk about here is this amazing book, and it's an idea called The Innovator's Dilemma. This is a book by Clayton Christensen who first identified this phenomenon. And he was trying to figure out why is it that it's so hard for companies to stay on top. If you look throughout history, it's very natural that companies will rise up and then somebody else follows them. We've seen it now with Uber and Yellow Cab. We've seen it with Netflix. One of the most common examples of this was actually um, the storage war, the computer storage wars of the 80s through the 90s. Right? We started with the floppies of the five and a quarter and then the three and a halfs and then CD-ROMs and hard drives and, and solid state. What's really interesting about that is no company managed to dominate two of those things, two iterations in a row. Despite the fact you would think there's not that much difference between a five and a half and a three, completely different companies. There's actually a really good reason for that. And this is the opportunity for each of us in this room. There's really two different ways that companies operate. There's the sustaining model, and this is what happens with market leaders, and it makes total sense. They've reached the, the pillar, the pinnacle of their success. They own most of the market. So what do they do? They want to stay on top, so they continue to do what their customers want them to do, which makes complete and perfect sense. That's what you should do. And so they, can, they dominate this by continuing to iterate with this sustaining mindset of keeping that base happy. They've not only technologically sustaining, they fix their business processes, they've optimized their hiring, their training, all their people are built to do the, what they're good at today. This is the what is market, as I call it. Now, new entrepreneurs come on the scene. They want to do something, they want to make money, they want to create. Well, they're, they're smart enough to know that they can't win if they go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the big guy. They already own the market, they already have the people, they're already ahead of them. So what entrepreneurs are going to do is embrace disruptive technology. And so what this means is they're going to attack a niche market, something smaller. They don't want to go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, something that the big guys don't want. They go after that. Maybe it might even be a market that's less profitable right now, but that's okay because they're small. And they're going to take risks on brand new technology that the other guys laughed about. And then what they're actually doing now is they're going to move in parallel. The sustainers are going to win with the what is market. The disruptors are going to kind of cruise along at the bottom, picking at the edges on the what might be market. And then inevitably, something happens. Could be a technical breakthrough like the disk drive market. Could be a, a uh, economic social upheaval. Something changes in the world, and now the what is market becomes the what was market. And the big guys are stuck because they're stuck because they've already optimized the process of their technology and their people to do something that people don't want anymore. The disruptors are already ahead of them. They've already got the new technology. They're also generally by the fact that they're smaller and more agile, they're better able to react to the new. Here's just some quotes by things that seemed really smart at the time where the sustaining market was mocking the dis disruptors. 
The horse is here to stay, but the automobile is only a novelty. I bet that made a lot of sense in 1922. There's no reason why anyone would ever want a computer in their home. Right? This stuff made sense at the time. And in hindsight, we realized how far away it was. And so right now, more than any time that I can remember in recent history, is the time for disruptors. COVID shook everything up. Right? This is the single biggest technological shift that I've seen in recent history. Everybody had to go home. Everything is upheaval. Those that were on top are no longer equipped to keep there, and we're waiting for the next generation of idea makers and creators to step forward. One of the ways to sort of represent how big of a shift this is, is I want to track the number of users using Microsoft Teams. Now, I'm not sure if everybody here has used Microsoft Teams or understands what it is. It's a tool created by Microsoft that just allows people that work at the same company to exchange text messages and, and video conference with one another. It's the kind of thing that's kind of nice when you see everybody every single day of your life. It moved from kind of nice to absolutely business imperative the moment we all went home. So let's look at these adoption numbers to get an idea of how crazy this last year was when it comes to cloud. From November to March, Microsoft added 12 million seats of Teams. Then they added another 12 one month later. So a 500% increase in rate. Then they doubled that rate again between April and May. And then doubled it again going into October. We saw, based on the original rate, decades of cloud transformation happened over the course of about nine months. And the key here is this has happened and it's never going back. This is some stats from a really interesting study that IDC did in June of 2020 where they're outlining some of the key markets that are gonna really see a lot of growth in the next year. And there's, it's probably not surprising, these are a lot of the people you'd expect, things like video conferencing, data security, cloud computing, et cetera. But the reason I put this up here isn't necessary to tell everybody to rush off and go do one of those top five things, although that's probably a really good business. The thing is, understand that if that's the business to go sell in, that means they have customers. And I want to use this to draw attention to the shift again like Rob did. We all need to pivot. Because the only companies that have survived the 2020 shutdown are those that have embraced things like video conferencing, data security, cloud computing. And all the companies that come after us are going to be born in the cloud. There's no going back. Right? This is going to change everything from restaurants have to have an online presence in, in delivery and virtual. We're seeing this in ad with drones and data analytics, um, cameras, healthcare, telehealth. Everything that we do, any of us, is going to be dramatically influenced by cloud technology. So with that, I just want to leave with one last thought, which for me is what the essence of technology is, the reason why I am so passionate about working with y'all today. And forgive me, I don't often get a captive audience so you get some more story time. Um, when I was first graduated college, I was sure that I knew everything. I was ready to go be the single best developer in the world as I didn't need to learn anything more. I was already an expert. And that lasted about 15 minutes into my first job when I went, oh no. <laughs> oh no, I don't know any of this stuff. And so I studied and I tried and there was a day about six months in that was resonates with me super clearly where I was completely in the weeds. And my team lead came over and in like five minutes he helped me out and he kind of took off like Superman and I thought to myself, man, one day, one day I'm gonna be Eric. And I'm gonna know everything and this is finally gonna be easy. And right on schedule like four years later, I was a team lead, managed my own team of kids fresh out of school, answering all their questions and still completely lost every single day. <laughs> and I was struggling and I was studying, I was reading books and I was trying to get better and I realized the problem was I had the wrong role model. As much as I like Eric, Eric wasn't the right guy, so I started talking to Dan, who was my principal engineer. Dan literally wrote the book. He had written books about software development. He'd been doing this for decades. Nobody ever knew more, and obviously, if I got as smart as Dan, it would be easy. And so I rededicated myself to my craft, and I studied, and I set up more servers, and I bought more books, and I practiced more, and I worked harder at technology. And again, right on schedule, like 10 years later, I was a principal engineer writing some really cool stuff. Um, on a Hadoop and HBase stack, flowing data with Kafka. We were writing a decision engine that was processing thousands of transactions a second with a 250 millisecond budget and at the same time processing through terabytes of data. It was cool. It was cool. <laughs> I was at the top of my game 
and I still was lost every single day, right? The problem was the ball moved on me again. And there was a day I was starting to feel kind of down because it was supposed to be easy by this point in time. And that's when the epiphany hit me. That's actually the magic of technology. That's, that's it. It never gets easy. It's, in fact, there's really no such thing as a technological expert. I think technological expertise just means I Google faster than the person next to me. <laughs> but that's cool, right? Because what I realized was the real magic of tech was that tomorrow was going to be another problem, something brand new that I didn't know how to solve. And then there was going to be a really cool piece of technology or a solution to it. And most importantly, I was going to be the one who was going to get to figure it out. And so that magic of discovery, that wonder, if you will, is, in my opinion, the real value of technology, that knowing that tomorrow can be something new and cool. And so when I talk to you tonight, and I get really, really excited about supporting what you're doing down here, what I'm really fired up about is bringing wonder to a bunch of people that haven't seen it yet. Thank you so much. I appreciate you all. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Q&A. Questions? Backstage. Favorite part of doing all of this? Uh, which part? The Fremont part? Yes. Oh, and question with the people. I, I love the juice you have down here. My favorite part, honestly, like, whether it's an emerging campus and seeing the energy there, going down to the old tech start building, to be honest with nothing else, like the, going to the coffee shop down on, on, on Main Street, Canyon City, and meeting people and talking to people and being a part of this thing, there is a community that exists down here that is really, really unique. And that's the same reason, to keep tying it back, why Pax 8 means so much to me. Like there's a community there that supports each other, and it's very, very similar to this thing that you have down here. Neighbors, friends, everybody looking out for one another. So aside from some of the job creation, what are the other types of things Pax 8 is looking at doing in the community, maybe with the high school or some of the other programs? That's a great question. So um, I think for the people on the phone, Brad asked, what are the things is Pax 8 looking to do in the community? And frankly, it's a lot of things. We're serious when we say we want to be a part of this. Right? And so part of that is you know, bringing in additional jobs. But once we're here, we want to get to know everybody. And I know that you've got some amazing things cooking with, again, P-Tech and the high school and, and internship programs that are part of Techstar. We would love to dovetail into that. We would love to you know, I've talked to the high school here, and we're going to be doing some conversations, some similar presentations like this with the high school students to try to inspire and connect. And, and really what I want to do is bring technology into the reach of everybody. Um, and really, we're open to ideas. And so I'm looking for requests from you. What, is, what does Fremont County want? How do we get involved more? How do we be a, a, a tighter part of this community? Will you acknowledge your team? Oh yeah, so thank you so much. I've got some uh, fantastic people here from Pax8. I've got Ashley Arnold, stand up. <laughs> Ashley is our manager of our Rural and Common Program, so she really kind of runs point for all this. We've got DJ James, who is one of our network uh, solutions consultants. And I've got Patrick Brown over here, who's been brave enough to so Patrick Brown has been one of the people here, and I apologize, I feel like I, when I talked about my first class, I really neglected to talk about the really amazing people that joined me on the help desk, which is Patrick Brown, Zach Kurtz, and Andrew King. And this is an amazing initiative because this is brand new. So they've been willing to jump into the deep end with me and figure this out every single day, and, and I really do appreciate that. Thank you, Patrick. Peter. <laughs> I may have said this earlier, but I Pax 8, there is, it's a great story um, on Pax 8. Um, at the high level, what it really means is I believe, I wish John here is listening in here, so I've kind of gone under the gun here, I gotta get this right. <laughs> but um, basically Pax is Latin for peace. Eight is not only a, China, a lucky symbol in China, but if you turn it on its side, it's infinite, and we sort of like this sort of idea of infinite peace. It's probably a little bit more, uh, Emotionally, you might have thought for a cloud software company. It's very deep for a cloud software company. I'd like to think that Pax 8's not your usual cloud software company. So in the news, uh, two weeks ago it was announced you just got a $96 million investment. What are the plans for the company to use that money? 
Great question. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of opportunity in front of us. One of the biggest things we've done recently is kick off our UK expansion. And so if you've seen in uh, social media or whatnot, we've opened up our first office in Bristol and are working to uh, bring the same wingman experience, support, education, and services to our friends across the pond. Awesome. Great. Do we have any questions on the... I just asked for questions, so okay. we shall see. I've got some friends in Bristol that will be watching you guys. <laughs> Love it. So, Craig, I had a, I know it comes up a lot. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Anthony. Now, is this a resource pack day that smaller businesses can utilize, or is it what size of business can you use it? Terrific question. So what we're really trying to do is empower, again, technology professionals. And so that can be sometimes very small MSPs, and so that's, MSP is our most common kind of partner, there's a few others. That stands for managed service provider. And so again, the idea is if you think about a business like a dentist, they probably don't have their own permanent IT person on staff. And so they're contracting somebody else to come in there, hook up their network, install software, run virus scans, take care of their, their IT infrastructure. That person or that company is who we're really trying to work with and support. And so sometimes we've got some very small MSPs with one or two employees. We also have some, some national ones that get much, much larger than that. And so the, this is where I get really excited about the Pax Value Proposition. Our real product, as much as I talk about those vendors, our real product is what we call the Wingman Experience, which is this idea that whatever an MSP needs or a partner needs to go be successful, and they're all different and they all need something else. And so if they need sales coaching and sales techniques, we've got that. And if they just need technical support, we've got that. If you want a, a sales engineer to help you out with something or you need professional services, whatever that piece is that makes their business go is what we do. And so to your question, I think it's all of them, but they might all take advantage of different pieces of that puzzle. Tell people, some of the people online might, might, might not realize you're in Florence, Colorado. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're in Florence, Colorado. I'll be honest, there's a lot of things, and I'll use that, I think, to talk about why I think this pilot is working so well. And there's a few key components here. One, just unbelievable people. I mean, I, I don't want to take anything away from Patrick and Teresa and Nathan and the rest of the crew. But there's also, there's a community interest here. There's some energy. And again, when I talk about going into the coffee shop, it's pretty fun when the coffee, when the, the barista knows who Pax 8 is. Right? There, there's a community support here which is hard to replicate. But a lot of this comes down to having an amazing campus and a place to put people. Right? That there's sort of two challenges when you're trying to stand something up. It's finding the right people and having some place for them to work where they've got good internet and a good location. And the emerging campus has been absolutely priceless for us to, to launch this, which is you know, the old high school in, in Florence, Colorado. Thank you. Uh, which employee in Florence has the shortest commute? <laughs> uh, that might be Patrick from what I've heard. <laughs> Patrick, how far do you have to uh, walk? <laughs> 20 feet. <laughs> Love it. Uh, so I won't be showing up in the snow. <laughs> you, get wet. So at the risk of putting people on the spot, one of my favorite things to do when I, when I get to travel and talk to our partners is before I even give a pitch like this, I just ask for a show of hands and I who's actually with Pax8, and then I ask them to describe what their experience has been like working with Pax8. Here, I'm gonna do a slight pivot on this. Um, Ashley, do you mind uh, describing to everybody what's Pax8 been for you? Pax8 has probably been one of the momentous moments of my life. Um, it's just gave, given meaning to so many different things of what I get to do every day and the culture I'm exposed to and the amazing people I get to work with. Um, I had no idea a company could have a culture and leadership like this. And to be inspired to innovate every single day and advocate for my team means more to me than any job I've ever had in my entire life. I'll just sum it up like this. This is the best company I've ever worked for in my professional career. And I'm pretty sure all my friends and family, they just assume I've joined a cult. <laughs> the way I'm promoting it and the way I talk about it. So. Patrick? DJ's exactly right. I posted on Facebook that, <clears throat> excuse me, I posted on Facebook a few weeks ago that uh, that this is the, this, I've waited 15 years for this kind of an opportunity where 
from the CEO down, everybody wants everyone else to succeed and will do everything they can to make that happen. And I had a, a friend of mine in Denver who's a, a pharmaceutical rep reply, sounds cultish. <laughs> so I said, want to join? <laughs> awesome, thank you guys. So um, probably some of the people in the room may have met Ashley before when we started the uh, FEDC Tech Start project January of 2017 we announced it here at this banquet on this right day. on this on this day four years ago <clears throat> and it was kind of a crazy idea and we had a, a bunch of milestones we wanted to hit all building up to the idea of being able to recruit a tech company, a real real tech company from Denver. We have a lot of tech incubation stuff going on here. So today, four years later, is that milestone. And everybody in this room uh, helped to support us getting here. So it's, it's a pretty big moment. And we're really thankful for having you here to come talk about that. Ashley, so when we started FEDC Tech Start, remember a year later, the state of Colorado recognized us as the state's second technology sector in the state. The first one's Denver Metro. We're the second. Four county area. The third is Boulder, right? So for four county representation, Ashley was the representative who was coming down here from Chafee County. So at one point, three years ago, she was the CEO of a startup that was blockchain based very hard to do any startup, super hard to do blockchain based, and even harder to do it rural. Uh, so she was doing all that and coming down here from Chafee County to represent uh, her county as part of this bigger project. So she's been so involved in this um, through her connections with PaxAid, and as all of this started, PaxAid brought her on full time as their rural programs coordinator. So I thought that was an amazing, uh, amazing thing. So Ashley has seen this program from the very beginning and now is the kind of the rural voice back to Pax 8 to, to connect the two cultures. So, and thanks again for doing this tonight, Craig. Yeah, totally. Thank you. And again, thank you everybody. Really do appreciate you hosting me tonight. Thank you so much. Just real quick, we've got a parting gift for you. Don't uh, drink it in the car. Uh, just just saying um, and just a, a thank you very much to, uh, to, to Craig and Pax8 and participating in uh, rural prosperity because you're going to be a linchpin in our future success so thank you very much for that uh, that effort um, we're gonna wrap it up here real quick uh, I've got a couple of quick things to say and then we'll uh, we'll, we'll finish up um, Sage Goodwin is our, our tech guy, uh, whatever you want to call him. He's done a great job tonight, and I was, I, was, I was deliberate in not thanking you earlier because I wanted to make sure you actually pulled it off. And uh, so far, so good, man. You, you, uh, you uh, rocked it. So, uh, very nice job. And then, uh, yeah, thank you. Good job. And then, Crystal, um, you know, I, I want to just hover on the point that uh, being the chairman of an organization experiencing, you know, a pandemic uh, clearly made uh, something that was incredibly difficult, and you handled it with grace and with success, and we appreciate your uh, contribution. And also, congratulations on your uh, promotion to the uh, big cheese for uh, SunWest, right? So, anyways, good job. Wow. All right, I'm going to wrap it up here. Is there any questions or anything that anybody would like to say? And if, if not, we'll, uh, we'll uh, wrap it up. And thank you very much. Have a safe trip home. Okay? All right, All right thank you.